Hello, and welcome to your most obedient and humble servant. This is a women's history podcast where we feature 18th century women's letters that don't get as much attention as we think they should. This week's letter is from Elizabeth Willing Powell to George Washington. I am very excited to introduce Samantha Snyder as my very first guest on the podcast. Hi, Samantha. Hi. (laughs) Samantha is the reference librarian at the Fred W. Smith National Library for the Study of George Washington at Mount Vernon and a fellow enthusiast for 18th century women's letters. She's pursuing her master's degree at George Mason University and is probably the world's foremost expert on Elizabeth Willing Powell. Actually, she has a uh, chapter that's going to be coming out pretty soon in a book. Um, What was that chapter again? Uh, It's a chapter in an upcoming book on George Washington and the women in his world. um, And it's called, at the moment, roughly titled, One of My Best Friends and Favorites, The Friendship of George Washington and Elizabeth Willing Powell. I actually met Samantha while I was doing some research at the Washington Library, and we just hit it off right away. She was one of the best archivists and librarians that I've had the pleasure to work with. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) All right. So before we get started, um, can you tell me a little bit about how you first discovered Elizabeth Willing Powell? Sure. Um, So it's kind of a random story. Um, So we have this box of documents at work. We tend to have what's called document viewings when we give tours of our library. Mm -hmm. And there is an Elizabeth Willing Powell letter to George Washington in that box of documents um, that actually was written on my mother's birthday, just a couple hundred years prior, but it's written on November 4th, 1792. And my mom's birthday is November 4th. And I won't say the year for her sake. (laughs) (laughs) And, um, So I was, I I at first was kind of intrigued just by the date. It made me look at the letter again. And then I started reading it and I was like, wow, this woman seems fascinating. (laughs) And then it all just kind of spun very quickly from there into, into this now almost two year long project. Um, So that, that's really how it all began. Um, I just think she's a fascinating woman. And as I did more research, on her, I realized how many letters we had back and forth between Elizabeth Powell, George Washington, and Martha Washington, and some other family members, too. Tell me a little bit about Elizabeth Willing Powell as a person. Sure. So Elizabeth Willing Powell, she um, was born in 1742 in Philadelphia. So she is about 10 years younger than Washington. Um, She was born into two very elite families. So she grew up pretty well connected from a young age. Um, She lived right in the city of Philadelphia um, for her whole life. She lived nearly on the same street. Um, But she was best known during her lifetime as a hostess of many salons at her house. So her house was on Third Street, and it was really the central location for a lot of gatherings with different politicians during the time. So George Washington, of course, was a a frequent attendant at these different events, and he took tea there a lot, and um, he had dinner there. Uh, but also people like John Adams were there, Marquis de Lafayette, uh, the Marquis de Chateau, all of these different men were, were going through that house and other elite um, families. So so she was really known as a connector of 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 people and really facilitated these kind of amazing conversations that happened throughout that time. Yeah, so sort of like this was and this was very early days for American Republic, so they weren't sure how similar the new American government was going to be to sort of the French court or the English court where there were a lot of these sort of salons and society events and things like that. Uh, so she's sort of the American version of that, would you say? Yes, I would say. I would say that definitely. Yeah. Yeah. On on my end, working with the George Washington papers, um, I heard about Elizabeth Willing Powell and when people were making the argument that George Washington had a lot of close female friendships, which was a side of him that I hadn't really ever heard of before. So I was always interested in that. But I've only seen the few letters with Elizabeth between with her and Martha. Um, Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. uh, Yeah. (laughs) When you sent me this one, I thought it was very exciting. Yes. Yes, I agree. (laughs) Uh, And is there anything that specifically about Elizabeth Willing Powell's letters that made you want to learn more about her? Um, just the way that they are phrased and the way she spoke. Um, I know people spoke differently in the 18th and early 19th centuries, but she just has a really eloquent way of speaking and a funny way of speaking too. And the way she talks to people, men and women, just kind of intrigued me. And I've enjoyed 
reading through her correspondence and actually transcribing her correspondence um, because I really get a feel for who she is as a person. And I feel very lucky that the person I chose to study has so many letters that still survive because I know not everyone is that lucky. Um, All right. So let's dig into it for the letter this week. Can you tell me a little bit about the context of this particular letter? Sure. So the letter is written in March of 1797. So what's going on with George Washington at the time this letter was written is he is on his way back to Mount Vernon. Um, He had decided not to serve a third term as president um, in September of 1796. And John Adams was elected in December of 1796, and then had just been inaugurated on the 4th, um, which is a few days before this letter was written. Washington was on his way back to to Mount Vernon and um, starts selling off a lot of his things that he didn't want to take back with him. Um, he he sells off his writing desk. He sells off some his his horses, and then we think he sold off his coach, but. That's a whole other story. <laughs> All right. And that's interesting that he's selling these things off also. Like, come on, George. Like, I know. Just I give know. people some stuff. <laughs> I know. I know that he's making everybody buy it. Um, yeah. But yeah. And then there's things that I know that he would want to, to have stay at Philadelphia and not go back to Mount Vernon, like Nellie Custis's dog. There's a funny letter where he, <laughs> he's like, I wouldn't mind if we forgot him. Snipe, the dog. I think I think it's name was Snipe. <laughs> That, that's oh doesn't he say that about Martha's birds too yes. doesn't Martha have some yes, birds yes <laughs> he's like just keep them there but sure enough they come back anyway um so so that's kind of the context of of what Washington is doing and so he's at this point sold Elizabeth the desk and she has it at her house um which is still surviving actually the house that she's living at at this point it's a historic house museum in Philadelphia and I highly recommend going and seeing it it's wonderful and the organization that runs it they're also wonderful um so so she gets this desk and um at this point in her life, her husband actually passed away during the yellow fever epidemic in 1793. Um, he died right at the end of September of 1793. So she's been a widow now for um, about all, just over three years. Um, and so she pretty quickly as a widow started taking on sole financial responsibility for her husband's estate. And then he also he owned a lot of land in Philadelphia and a lot of homes in Philadelphia. So she's managing those properties um, and also still entertaining, still purchasing new things for her house, including this desk. So, so she is a widow, um, but she's not isolated. She, there's plenty of letters that still talk about going to her house and having tea and having drinks and that sort of thing. So that's really the context of her life at that point. All right. So without further ado, Um, let's read this letter. Okay. All right. So, okay. This letter was written on March 11th, 1797. My very dear sir, like a true woman, as you will think in the moment of exaltation and on the first impulse, for you know, we are never supposed to act systematically or from attentive consideration. I take up my pen to address you as you have given me a complete triumph on the subject of all others on which you have, I suppose, thought me most deficient and most opposite to yourself. And what is still more charming, your candor shall preside as judge. Nay, you shall pass sentence on yourself, and I will not appeal from your decision. Suppose I should prove incontestably that you have, without design, put into my possession the love letters of a lady addressed to you under the most solemn sanction, and a large packet, too. What will the goddess of prudence and circumspection say to her favorite son and votary for his dereliction of principles to which he has hitherto made such serious sacrifices? Was the taste of your sex predominant in your breast, and did the love of variety so preponderant that because you had never blundered as president? President, was you determined to try its delights as a private gentleman, but to keep you no longer in suspense, though I know that your nerves are not as irritable as a fine lady's, yet I will with the generosity of my sex relieve you by telling you that upon opening one of the drawers of your writing desk, I found a large bundle of letters from Mrs. Washington bound up and labeled with your usual accuracy. Mr. Lear was present. I immediately desired him to take charge of the package, which he declined, alleging that he thought it was safer in my hands, at least for some time. 
him. At first I urged it, but finding him inflexible, as I supposed from motives of delicacy, I sealed them up, and I trust it is unnecessary for me to add that they will be kept until I deliver them to him or to your order. As Mr. Lear has been connected both with you and Mrs. Washington, and as it is probable that some family circumstances may have been mingled into her communications to you, to save his feelings, I have sealed the package with three seals bearing the impression of my blessed friend's arms, such as that I myself use. Should Mrs. Washington appear to have any unpleasant sensations on this subject, you will, I am certain, remove them by reminding her that though curiosity is supposed to be a prominent feature of the female mind, it will ever be powerfully counteracted when opposed by native delicacy or sense of honor, and I trust a pious education. <laughs> I shall, my good sir, give to Mr. Lear $245, which I find was the first cost of the writing desk. In my estimation, its value is not in the least diminished by your use of it, nor from its having been the repository of those valuable documents that originated with you during your wise and peaceful administration for eight years. I am sensible many true and handsome compliments might be paid to you on this occasion, but as they have been resounded with elegance and sincerity, through the whole continent and will be re-echoed by posterity as you must be conscious they are just and as you are not a man of vanity i will not in my blundering way attempt a theme that i feel myself totally inadequate to as blundering would not have to me even the charm of variety to recommend it that is such a I good no <laughs> i know especially because she is so eloquent she talks like this a lot about oh my scrawl oh my rambling blah 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 blah. but and so there's there's this paragraph left and then the postscript all right and now let me return you thanks for your tributes of affection mr lear has sent me in your name a pair of lamps and brackets with the appendages and as a postscript i believe two of these still survive at mount vernon i think I think. Oh, cool. <laughs> anyway, from you, they are acceptable, though from no other being out of my own family would I receive a pecuniary favor, nor did I want any inanimate memento to bring you to my recollection. I most sincerely hope to hear that you are all well and safely arrived at Mount Vernon long before you will receive this scrawl. Be pleased to present my best wishes to Mrs. Washington and Miss Custis. Truly and affectionately, I have the honor to be, sir, your most obedient and obliged, Elizabeth Powell. And she dockets it as His Excellency General Washington, sent by the post Monday 20th instant. So the copy that I'm reading from is a, is a draft copy. Postscript, March 13th. Mr. Lear dined with me yesterday. I desired him not to mention the circumstance alluded to in the first paragraph of this letter. Therefore, Mrs. W. need not be informed of it unless you choose to tell her yourself. E.P. <laughs> Uh, this is it such a really good letter. Is. I was just so excited when you I sent know, me this letter. I know, because I know we talked about a couple of different ones, and I was sitting there, like, kind of brainstorming some other ideas, and then I thought, well, God, these are just too good. So, so obviously, she's using a lot of very flowery language, which is something that is very yes. common at the time, and I think um, she's actually doing it quite well. But if you were going to summarize, just for some a modern listener, what is going on in this letter? What has happened? So, to summarize it for a modern listener, she has bought a desk from him and in the 18th century Washington would often store his letters in desks but the fact that it's something so private as letters from a wife to to um, her husband she's teasing him about it and the whole thing that is so funny that I really like is the whole bit at the beginning about never blundering as president I think that's so fascinating that she's like, you never made any mistakes when you were president and you are determined, <laughs> yes. were you determined to try its delights as a private gentleman? So basically she's saying, now you're like the rest of us. That's how I interpret that. Like, oh, you were so perfect <laughs> oh, okay. until now you're not. <laughs> Well, I also, because she's sort of, she's, she doesn't come right out with the fact that they're his no, wife's letters no. right away. So is she sort of implying for just a second that he, she has love letters for him from someone and just trying to get him to get a little nervous? And then she halfway says, oh, I have the love letters yeah, from your that's, wife. That's what I think is that she's trying to tease him. She's trying to be like, hey, I found some love letters. And then, and then. She knows, I think she knew that Washington wouldn't have cheated on his 
wife, although although there yeah. are historians who argue that he cheated on Martha Washington with Elizabeth Cole. But, uh, but which, yeah. you know, sometimes <laughs> these letters, it's kind of like, hmm. Uh, but, but, but yeah, I think that's kind of, that's what she's doing is, is teasing him about something that she knew he would probably never do. Right. And, and like, I'm also of the side that like 18th century correspondence just tends to be more Absolutely. flirty sounding to Absolutely. a modern audience. But also like, wouldn't it be crazy though, if he was <laughs> cheating on Martha Washington with Elizabeth Powell for him to then yes. sell her a desk that yes. has his wife's love letters yes. in it? <laughs> That would add a little twist to that knife, I think. That would add a big old twist. In the- so so how does he respond to this letter? Oh, and it, yes. So I will read you his first bit where he responds to her beginning paragraph. So, so this letter from George Washington to Elizabeth Powell is written on the 26th. So at this point, he is back at Mount Vernon. Um, and so he gets her letter as, as it says at the bottom her, of her letter, she sent it on the 20th and he gets it at Mount Vernon. Mm-hmm. And so he responds back just as flirtily, I would say. It's, <laughs> it's pretty funny. It's very unlike Washington to be quite so, um, not so formal in his letters, I guess. I'll go ahead and read a little bit of, of his letter. My dear madam, a mail of last week, brought me the honor of your favor, begun the 11th and ended the 13th of this instant. Had it not been for one circumstance, which by the by is a pretty material one, that I had no love letters to lose, the introductory <laughs> with without the explanatory part of your letter would have caused a serious alarm and might have tried how far my nerves were able to sustain the shock of having betrayed the confidence of a lady." But although I had nothing to apprehend on that score, I am not less surprised at my having left those letters of Mrs. Washington in my writing desk, when, as I suppose I had emptied all the drawers, mistaken in this, however, I have to thank you for the delicacy with which they have been treated. But admitting that they had fallen into more inquisitive hands, the correspondence would, I am persuaded, have been found to be more fraught with expressions of friendship than of enamored love, and consequently, if the ideas of the possessor of them, with respect to the latter passion, should have been of the romantic order to have given them the warmth, which was not inherent, Ooh. they might have been committed to the flames. <laughs> 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 so... So that's all he says on that. And then he goes into detail about his his trip back from Philadelphia, which in the amount of times I've now taken trips back and forth from Philly, I realize he's basically taking 95. He goes through Chester, (laughs) then he goes through um, Maryland. And it's just, I'm like, oh, I recognize all these towns. (laughs) Yeah, so really, that's it. At the end, there's kind of a nice little, I'll read this last little paragraph, because this is something that all of our curators and people that work at Mount Vernon find kind of interesting. He says, okay, we, so this is after they've arrived back. He says, we are like the beginners of a new establishment, having everything in a manner to do houses and everything else to repair rooms, to paint paper, whitewash, et cetera, et cetera. But although these things are troublesome and disagreeable as they will involve us in a good deal of litter and dirt, yet they will serve to give exercise to both the mind and body. My paper reminds me of the necessity of concluding, which I shall do with the best wishes of Mrs. W. and Miss Custis, added to my insurances of being, dear madam, your most obedient and affectionate servant, George Washington. So that's that's the send off, which is kind of nice. Yeah, that's really um, but sweet. I think, yeah, yeah. And I think the part's kind of cool about they have embarked on a new journey yet again, because they'd been in, you know, very society Philadelphia for several years and probably seen a lot of beautiful homes and they wanted right. to... to to make theirs more contemporary. It's also, it's funny that he starts it out being sort of a little bit racy with, you know, if Mm -hmm. there were any letters that were more romantic, (laughs) you would burn them. And then he ends very, you know, very George Washington and, Yes, very I'm just formal. Imagining all these really very spicy Martha Washington letters that she sent him <laughs> during know, the revolution that he cast I into know. the flames. <laughs> <laughs> it is so interesting. And it's I still what's interesting about these this correspondence is that it really doesn't make clear who the letters ended up with or how they got to where they are. She talks about dining with Tobias Lear, but she doesn't necessarily say she gave the letters to him i think it's kind of implied yeah but it is kind of interesting to think 
are those still out there somewhere bound up with the seal of the with the Powell family seal? For people who might not be aware, Martha Washington burned all of her correspondence with George. Uh, and I think there's only three letters that survive and one of them is a very small note. Um, so some any letters between them would just be such an amazing find, be something be that we'd really be yeah. interested in. Yeah, um, absolutely. Absolutely. And also the Tobias Lear that they keep mentioning, um, if you're not familiar with him, he was a secretary of the Washingtons for quite a few years and he married not one but two of Martha's nieces <laughs> both of them named Fanny yes <laughs> which has always been uh just ridiculous to me <laughs> I know. It's, a, it's a weirdly Tobias Lear heavy episode yeah um, all right so okay back to the letter um one of the things that sort of struck me when I first looked at it is how much Elizabeth Willing Powell talks about being like a true woman uh, and her feminine nature and feminine curiosity and things like that. Um, So why do you think she used that kind of language in here? She, well, she, in a lot of her letters is very, um, talks about being a, a timid woman and this sort of stuff. And I've always been kind of intrigued by that. And I think it was partially a practice of the time. Like a lot of times women would do that similar with the scrawl at the end and burn this letter, that sort of yeah. stuff. Um, but she is very focused on gentility and manners. Um, that's something mm-hmm. I have noticed. And she, she, um, reads quite a bit and she reads a lot of different types of books, yeah, so I think it kind of comes from that. Maybe it comes from her education and her her focus. Maybe because she was a hostess and hosted salons for so long, she she kind of grew up in the world of being this I don't know kind of eloquent figure, and you you needed to be on your best. Did she behavior. spend any time in France? Because it so she has it seems like she has the sort of French salon style type. Uh, she to did her not. She did not, which is actually very interesting. She never left. Um, well, the Philadelphia region, she went to Virginia, um, and she would go up to visit family in Germantown, and then over to New Jersey. Um, But as far as I'm aware, she never left those couple of states. She never went abroad. um, But she read like crazy. And and that kind of comes through how much she knows just based on reading and other people when they talk about her talk about her love of reading and talk about Mm -hmm. how knowledgeable she is and um even the the Marquis de Chateau uh he references that though she has not traveled she has read a great deal and it I mean you can definitely tell from her writing style she has that sort of 18th century long sentences lots of emotion things like that definitely Um, definitely compared to somebody like Martha who doesn't read as much um and she didn't have a very good education she sort of writes if it's a long sentence it's just a run-on sentence with that exactly. a lot of short yeah. points within yeah. it yeah. yeah whereas this yeah. seems like um th- she's definitely going for a style here which is really interesting it is interesting and and it's it's a very consistent style throughout her life um even the earliest letters i've looked at are from when she's about 26 27 and she mm-hmm. speaks very similarly to how she does when she's in her 70s like she just kind of has that way of speaking and I've looked at some of her siblings letters um, and they have a similar way of speaking but even they address how she is as a person and kind of her unique sense of self um, to be polite. (laughs) Now I I love the little postscript at the end because she definitely is polite in giving George Washington an out where he doesn't have to admit to Martha that he gave away some of her love letters Uh, which is (laughs) I think very interesting. (laughs) It is. It's kind of like woman protecting woman almost because they were, they were friends. So it's like, but it does make me wonder too, like, 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 I guess that was nice of Elizabeth to be like, oh, by the way, you can just like slip these back in. Don't, don't worry about telling her. Like, and I think part of that comes from, um, with her saying that she, she sealed them up. So I think Martha would have recognized the the Powell seal because Elizabeth sealed her letters to them quite often and Samuel Powell did when he was alive so I do think that that's part of it too that that I think she's saying like you can take them out of that if you want because then Martha won't know that someone else has seen these letters besides you (laughs) so or at least that's how I'm interpreting that I don't know (laughs) yes yeah and this adds to my ongoing um evidence pile that Martha Washington could 
be a force of nature when she was angry. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Because if she was the demure woman that sometimes she's portrayed as, I don't think either George or Elizabeth would would care about this bundle yes. of letters. Like so so clearly she is a force of nature in her own right. And I think that's why Elizabeth Powell was friends with her as well, because she had her own sense of, of being a powerful woman. All right. Any any sort of Thoughts. I guess the other thing is, and we talked about this a little bit, like Elizabeth Powell teasing George Washington like this and for him to respond with just sort of teasing back is just a really different side of George Washington than we usually see. And also, um, there's a lot of people who say anybody who interacted with George Washington ever was one of his close friends. <laughs> you notice that in a lot of books, yeah. people are always trying to get like a yeah. connection to Washington. But Elizabeth Willing Powell, just from this exchange, you can tell this is somebody who was actually very close with George Washington, and they actually had a really good book. Absolutely, rapport. I agree. I think I think in in looking at some other ways Washington interacted with different people and and, and interacted with other women, he he clearly had a respect for women, and he um, he writes to um, Anna Stockton and Elizabeth Graham Ferguson and Catherine Macaulay Graham, and he you know he has kind of intellectual letters with them, but I've not seen anything like this with another woman <laughs> where he's he's being so kind of open and kind of just silly in, yeah. in in the way George Washington can be silly, silly. I guess. <laughs> This, this is peak Washington silly, I think. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, the only comparable thing is is him and the Marquis de Chateau. I think they have kind of a, a similar weird sort of back and forth. Um, but I think that shows with Washington, I think it shows a level of respect, too, that mm. he feels like he can be a little less stoic than he normally is. So, but yes, they, and, and they kind of have, this is by far the most flirty their letters are, mm. or like most kind of teasing but they definitely have a rapport going like he he writes her a little note in the 1780s they are going to go see and i think you probably recognize this letter the 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 little note about the school for scandal where mm. he says he he's going on a fishing trip the next day so he can't go to a play with the Powells, but he, and it's called the school for scandal. And he says something along the lines, I don't have it in front of me, but he says something along the lines of, um, I know I need a lesson in the school for scandal. Like, <laughs> you could tell he probably thought that was so funny. <laughs> All right. Well, I just want to say thank you so much, Samantha, for joining oh, me. Absolutely. This was a delight. Absolutely. This was so fun. <laughs> As always, I am your most obedient and humble servant. This is Catherine. I just wanted to cut in and thank you so much for listening to Your Most Obedient and Humble Servant. Uh, I've been absolutely thrilled and so thankful for all of the support we've received so far. This is a small podcast that I make pretty much on my own. So any, literally any help you are able to give to promote it goes a very long way. A quick thing that you can do to help the podcast is to go into iTunes and rate and review the podcast there. Uh, it's silly, but it's just sort of an algorithmic thing. It leads more people to the podcast. Also, if you want to spread the word, you can tweet at us. Uh, we're on Twitter at H-U-M-S-E-R-V-T, hum servant. Of course, as always, the best way to promote a podcast is word of mouth. So feel free to tell all of your nerd friends and your history friends and your feminist friends, anybody uh, about the podcast. Um, once again, I just want to thank you so much for listening. Uh, I've just been overwhelmed by the kind words and support that we've gotten so far. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Uh, so thank you so much for listening.